morning, everyone, and please do feel free to interrupt me and ask questions if uh, I think it will make it more fun for everyone, uh, including myself. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, yeah, by the way, here is a disclaimer. There will be a consider considerable overlap between uh, my talk today and Bashak's talk yesterday. Uh, um, I hope it's all right. Uh, usually, you know, uh, kind of, whenever I, I give the same talk several times, like over a period a year, I feel self-conscious about it. But then I sort of tend to think that it may be more arrogance than uh, modesty because, you know, just like, why would I expect people to remember what I talked about a few months ago? I usually don't. Uh, so in any event, uh, the, first, the first subject I want to uh, touch upon is actually what to do when uh, the Conley conjecture uh, fails. Um, let's say we have uh, one of the pseudo rotations of the sphere or things like that. So what to expect? And the, by far the uh, most important result uh, here is a theorem of Franks that says that if I have an area preserving diffeomorphism of the sphere, and for the sphere it's the same as Hamiltonian, and the number of fixed points of the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of this Hamiltonian diffeomorphism is it at least three, then the number of simple periodic orbit is infinite. Then it has infinitely many uh, periodic orbits. One can do a bit better than that. There are also gross results. By local mass and others, and while the original proof uh, was um, purely like low dimensional dynamics, recently, a few years ago, there was a um, purely symplectic proof. By Kerman. Unfortunately, Kerman's proof is also low dimensional. It's a beautiful argument, but low dimensional. Now, this theorem is extremely important. For instance, it is one of the key steps in proving that um, any Riemannian metric on S2 has infinitely many closed geodesics. Note that two here, let's rewrite this. Let's rewrite this greater than or equal than three as greater than two. Then this two is the minimal number of fixed points of phi possible, and this comes from Arnold's conjecture. So there is this machine here. I, all right, I'll practice uh, during the break how to use it. It looks incredible fun, uh, but maybe I shouldn't do it now. So uh, this observation sort of um, uh, led uh, Hofer and Zender to the following conjecture. That if the if a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism 
has as few as possible from the Arnold, from the Arnold conjecture perspective fixed points. So this number is as small as possible. Then the uh, then it has infinitely many periodic orbits. So, um, of course, what does it mean as few as possible? The, uh, oh, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, if it has more than necessary, that the way around, of course. Uh, if it has more than necessary uh, fixed points, then it has infinitely many periodic orbits. Of course, there are different interpretations of what the minimal possible number uh, is, depending on whether you think about the uh, non-degenerate case of the Arnold conjecture or um, you name it. And besides, the Arnold conjecture is not perfect either. So, uh, Nobody knows what to put here. So, uh, we know for sure, however, that for CPN, uh, the right number is n plus 1. So S2 here is CP1, and the minimum is 1 plus 1 equal to 2. Well. Um, this conjecture, in some sense, is misleading. And in, uh, it's misleading in the way that, of course, when you see a conjecture like that, let's say we focus on the non-degenerate case. Um, the way you want to prove it, you look at the floor complex, and it has more than necessary generators, and then somehow you want to algebraically manipulate it in a clever way. And uh, say this generators have somehow to cancel out, and for that you got to have like more and more periodic orbits. And this absolutely does not work. So uh, there is no like rational reason to think why, to understand why it, uh, it cannot work, but uh, there have been not a single result, substantial result proved this way, uh, not with Fleur Hamon. So there is a slightly different uh, form of the conjecture, which I like uh, better. This one is due to Gurel, which says that if phi has an orbit that does not have to be there, that looks totally unnecessary, Then there are infinitely many periodic orbits. And this turned out to be rather fruitful. Let me give some examples. So uh, one class of examples is that when you have, uh, is what uh, she has been talking about and will be talking about. So when you have a non-contractable one periodic orbit, then in many cases you have infinitely many simple and indeed, whenever you have a symplectic manifold, you take a C2 small autonomous Hamiltonian, it's one periodic orbits are fixed points. They're all contractible. They don't have to be there. Uh, likewise, she has kind of a semi-local uh, result. I don't want to uh, 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 talk about it um, for... Hamiltonians on R2n 
hyperbolic at infinity. So all of a sudden, when you think sort of in these terms, you can prove there are, there are results you can prove. You can make progress. So one theorem I want to uh, spell out is the following theorem. Theorem. So let's say I have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CPN with a hyperbolic one periodic orbit or fixed point. Then so that simply means that uh, the differential, the derivative of uh, uh, phi at this point has no eigenvalues on the unit circle. Then phi has infinitely many uh, infinitely many simple periodic orbits. So how does it fit in the context of this uh, Gorel's conjecture? Well, it fits um, when we think about the quadratic Hamiltonian on CPN, uh, one of these contraexamples. I mentioned at the end of the last lecture, these guys generate phi with exactly n plus one orbits and all the, uh, with exactly n plus one fixed points and uh, periodic orbits, but they all are elliptic. So, a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of CPN does not have to have a hyperbolic orbit. And that's an example where uh, an unnecessary orbit actually creates uh, infinitely many uh, periodic orbits. If I could replace hyperbolic by non-elliptic, which would fit in the conjecture too, I would be able to uh, prove the, at least the non-degenerate case of the Hopper-Zender conjecture because if you have more than n plus one for CPN, then at least one of the points uh, has to be non-elliptic. So, but uh, this argument falls uh, short of that. Now, um, it works not only for CPN, but for several other manifolds, like uh, some Grassmannians, a product of CPN with a um, symplectically spherical manifold, and, and, and several more. So I'm going to say a few words um, later, probably tomorrow or on Thursday, about the proof. And also, it works and for some other manifolds and for non contractible orbits as well. But then, of course, the manifold. Uh, has to admit non-contractable orbits, so uh, it would have to be something like the product of uh, C CPN and in an aspherical manifold. So one more thing to two more things to mention. First of all, in all contraexamples, uh, sort of that's a remark just more along the lines of what is known and what is unknown. 
A remark is that whenever we have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with finitely many, uh, with finitely many simple periodic orbits, so whenever we have a counterexample to the Conley conjecture, two things happen. First of all, right away, the simple periodic orbits are the fixed points, the fixed points. So in other words, they all occur already at the very first iteration, and then nothing new happens. It cannot be that sort of you start with some number of uh, fixed points, then you get a few more simple periodic orbits, and then the process stops. And this cannot happen by one of these conjectures, because if you have, uh, if you have some, you have already the minimal number, then once you create some more, you got more than necessary. And therefore, the, the process should continue. So this is one thing that happens. This is kind of an experimental fact. And the second fact is that phi is strongly non-degenerate. In other words, phi and its iterations are all non-degenerate, which also sort of would mean that here in this conjecture, we should focus on the uh, non-degenerate case exclusively. Otherwise, you would have infinitely many cases. No results, however, this is kind of all experimental facts, or uh, just um, sort of more about the lack of examples than uh, anything else. No results in either direction. Secondly, sort of just to emphasize what we know. Uh, which one? This, this, this are conjectures. They are wide open for CP2. So uh, I would say it's legitimate to ask any question you can answer. But the first and the most interesting question concerns CP2 as far as uh, this is the first non-trivial and wide open case. So yeah, well, when you ask this, this uh, you see, I mean, the Conley conjecture covers a lot of manifolds and conjecturally covers even more. So there are many manifolds for which you by default, expect to have infinitely many periodic orbits. So there are relatively few manifolds you can apply to CP2. Now, there is another aspect of the question, and this has to do with generic existence. So, conjecture. Uh, for any closed manifold W, a C infinity generic Hamiltonian diffeomorphism has infinitely many simple periodic orbits. So even though the, the Conley conjecture actually um, fails sometimes, generically it still holds. The most interesting point here is that th this is unknown. And kind of the second most interesting uh, point is that it's not even clear how to approach the question but uh, at least not, uh, not immediately clear to me kind of what tools to use. Um, 
So here is a theorem. A theorem. A fairly easy one. Uh, that assume one of the following. That either the odd de degree homology of W with coefficients in something, does not matter what, is non zero. Or the minimal churn is not small. Or W is CPN, which of course fits into this picture or in, in, into the second case. So here n is n plus 1. Or a complex Grassmannian. Or one of some class of manifolds. Um, for instance, I can take any of these guys and product them with something simplectically spherical. It would be OK. Then the conjecture holds. I'm going to outline the proof of this uh, theorem later. Uh, here the first uh, assertion which covers like most of the manifolds and, uh, and the second two come from different sources in fact. Here in these two cases, the uh, main reason is that whenever you have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism with finitely many periodic orbits, uh, the actions and mean indices must satisfy certain relations, certain numerical relations. And numerical relations are easy to break by a small perturbation. Um, a couple of Related results. One of, oops, before I get there. So, w one of the important facts here is that the conjecture is really about C, C infinity generic existence. If I replace C infinity by C1, or in, yeah, by C1, sort of C1 generic uh, version of this conjecture is an immediate consequence of a result in dynamics known as the closing flamma. So it's very easy to create uh, periodic orbits. No, okay, it's not easy. It's actually non-trivial result, but it's well known how to create periodic orbits by small perturbation. Uh, but the closing claim actually fails uh, in the C infinity category. You cannot create periodic orbit uh, by C infinity small perturbation. The second uh, f uh, result which I wanted to mention in connection with this uh, conjecture, uh, the theorem is a theorem of Asaoka and Iri. And it concerns surfaces. So W is a closed surface. Then for then sort of uh, then periodic the set of then periodic orbits are C infinity generically. Dense in W. 
Again, here, if I replace infinity by C1, um, this would follow from the closing lemma, at least maybe with uh, a little bit of work, so the C infinity part is important. The proof is actually, well, it's based on the same principle that there is actually a similar result by uh, Erie for rep flows in three dimensions, and uh, this theorem kind of is proved by a similar method. And the idea is that, again, there, if you have um, If you have finitely many uh, orbits, there are certain asymptotic resonance relations uh, uh, coming from, uh, the, uh, fr from the embedded compact, uh, contact homology. And these resonance relations are easy to break by local perturbations. They're extremely sensitive to local perturbations, and therefore, by uh, making small local perturbations, you, uh, you can create infinitely many periodic orbits. That's sort of the idea of the proof. And now the main sort of open question I see here proof and analog. of Asaoka Iri theorem for at least one symplectic manifold of dimension greater than two. So um, one cannot expect it or one should not expect it to hold for every symplectic manifold um, because of some examples of Erman. They do not apply literally, but I think, uh, uh, so uh, if, if I had to conjecture, then I would say it probably falls, probably holds for CP2, but almost surely fails for the four-dimensional torus. So I, th I think that's kind of an extremely interesting question. On par with sort of proving this conjecture for uh, all many. Are there any questions? Yes. So, um, Irman, okay, 44 with an irrational. First of all, I should say 44 with a linear but irrational symplectic uh, form. Second, and there is a Contra-example of uh, Erman, um, sort of uh, his contra-example to see infinity um, closing lemma. I think he does it for autonomous perturbations, but I think his argument just by sort of passing to uh, extending the uh, phase space by adding time to it should carry over in the time-dependent case. So I'm, uh, it, it probably follows. I have not checked, but it, it's, it's very close to failing on the nose, I would say. It's probably like a genuine expert in dynamics, like KM would tell you right away that this is. So Irman's non-closing lemma. In, it's, it's already discussed uh, pretty nicely in the book by Hofer and Zender. So. Uh, are there other questions? Yeah. 
Which one? I don't know. Uh, this one, I don't know. Uh, this theorem, this theorem is easy. Uh, I don't know. I, I just don't quite see uh, the tools to answer this question. And the problem is, um, if you have an arbitrary symplectic manifold, there is very little you can say about it. It's, it's, it's pretty much a transcendental object. So, um, not entirely clear how, how to do it. Basically, symplectic topological tools beyond um, the Arnold conjecture pretty much fail for an arbitrary symplectic ma manifold. There is nothing you can say. So, so, so um, I don't know. All right, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do probably something entirely redundant but, uh, and unnecessary, but the, the next item on my plan is to review uh, the Fleur theory. Um, much of what I'm going to see, you know, but somehow I really don't know how to get around this. Uh, so just, if you get entirely bored, please do interrupt me like. I can dance for your thing just to make it more entertaining. Well, you would not want me to dance or sing. Or sing. So, um, Hamiltonian Fleur homology. Again, there will be a uh, kind of a minimalist treatment. Some overlap with what Bashak did. So let's say I have a time dependent Hamiltonian on a closed symplectic manifold. I have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, and I have the fixed points, which are also one periodic orbits. Um, then these guys are critical points of the action functional. And the action functional is defined on the space of all contractible loops in W to R. There are all sorts of conventions here. Um, the one I want to use is that the integral that the value of the action functional on a loop, on a contractible loop, gamma is equal to the negative symplectic area bounded by gamma plus the integral of of the Hamiltonian along gamma. In other words, I'm taking a disk bounded by gamma, integrating the uh, symplectic form of uh, uh, it and then adding the integral of the Hamiltonian. So this integral uh, is not well defined, so, and I need to make additional assumptions for this to work. For instance, I need to make sure this integral is independent of the disk I take. And the assumptions I want to start with are that uh, omega on pi 2 is equal to 0, and 
in a sec, I will need another assumption. So let me uh, uh, let's make it right away that the first churn class of the manifold is also equal to zero on pi two. In this case, we say that the manifold is symplectically spherical. Oops, there is one more thing. So, Fleur theory is Morse theory. To do Fleur theory, I need to uh, um, have the action functional uh, non-degenerate Morse. And it turns out that sort of the Morse condition for the action functional is exactly the non-degeneracy condition for periodic orbit. Actually, a priori, these two come from totally different sources. So it's not immediately obvious in, or um, maybe it's obvious, but nonetheless, the two definitions come from two different sources. So uh, it's not entirely, uh, it's, yeah, it's not immediately obvious, but th that the two conditions are equivalent. But nonetheless, there, and so I want it to be non-degenerate. All right, then. Then whenever X is non-degenerate one periodic orbit, one can associate to it an integer called the conley zander index of x. I'm going to spend some time defining it because it comes from quite non-trivial linear algebra. And then the Fleur complex of well, I will interchangeably write phi here or h. But actually, what I want to write is h. Uh, so here, or in between them, is a complex for our purposes. It will be z2. Generate, so let's put some number m here. Generated by. one periodic orbits of index M of constant index equal to M. Then there is a differential, the Fleur differential from on, on this complex, which I'm going to define in a second. But here is one point before I proceed, uh, somewhat controversial, that actually it almost does not matter what the differential is unless you want to prove some properties of uh, the Fleur homology. And the reason is that, okay, it's not entirely true. Um, it matters what it, uh, what it is as long as it is zero. Because when it is non-zero, you almost never, in with very few exceptions, can actually calculate it. Just like it's, it's probably a feature uh, of many homology theories that if the differential is non-trivial, there is very little you can say. It sort of proliferates over uh, many, like spectral sequences, right? I mean, 99 applications of spectral sequence uh, uh, amount to the fact that the spectral sequence collapses or nearly collapses. So homology is actually the most useful case of homology is when the homology is zero, or when the differential is zero, at least. So, um, yeah, and uh, 
comes from a different uh, area. Many, many years ago, in some sense, my teacher, Dmitry Fuchs, told me that homology can be useful only as long as it is finite dimensional. And I took it for, I took it at face value. And many years uh, after that, I, I kind of, I came to the point of challenging it. This is, this is wrong. An infinite dimensional homology space can be useful too, when it is zero. An infinite dimensional space can be zero. And that means that some abstractions vanish. And that's, a, that's very useful in information. So in any event, the differential. So, so um, now I'm going to, I'm going just to say a few words here. I, I'm, I'm not going to use uh, my, I'm going to uh, fix an almost complex structure compatible with omega. And given two orbits, x and y, of adjacent indices, so this here, the condescender index is m, and the, the index is m minus 1. This is how the differential is, uh, is going to work. I'm going to take the cylinder S1 cross R and map it to the symplectic manifold such that this map U satisfies a perturbed cauchy riemann equation. So if I denote the coordinate on R by S and on uh, S1 by T, then the equation, as, as I usually write it, is that the partial derivative of U plus J, the partial derivative of T uh, of U with respect to T is equal to the negative gradient of, of H. There are two sort of complementary ways to think about this equation. The first way is assume that U is independent of T. So it's just a map from R. Then this term disappears. And what I'm looking at is the anti-gradient trajectory of H, at least, well, H is time dependent, at least when H is independent of time. So in fact, what I'm doing here is something like the Morse theory of H. In fact, it's not quite the Morse theory of H. In fact, what I can rewrite this equation along the same line as uh, by taking this term and moving it to the right. What I have is negative L2 gradient of the action function. So now from this, this is just a reformulation of the same, um, of the same equation. Now uh, I'm, I'm looking at the L2 gradient of the, now it's like I'm doing the uh, more theory of, uh, L2 more theory of the action function on the loop space. Of course, such an object does not exist. The flow of the right hand side does not exist. So if I take a general loop and try to think of the flow of this vector field on the space of loops, uh, the, the, the initial value can, uh, problem will have no solution, not even for a short time. So the second perspective is, let's forget about the Hamiltonian. Let's assume the Hamiltonian is zero. Then what I have is a cauchy riemann equation. And now having x fixed, I'm interested in solutions u connecting x and y. So in the additional, uh, the extra condition here is that u in the loop space converges to x as s goes to negative infinity and y as s goes to the positive infinity. So I'm looking at the trajectories u connecting x and y. So now what I'm uh, 
solving is not the initial value problem, but, a per, uh, but it's sort of asymptotic boundary value problem for an elliptic operator. And it's a much, much better object than the initial value problem for a uh, kind of very non-smooth vector field. So the, uh, the point is that such uh, solutions exist and have all the nice properties. And then the differential is, oh no. All right. We remember what was on, the, on this board. Um, and if we don't, it doesn't matter. So the differential, uh, let's denote by mxy all solutions from x to y when under suitable additional uh, condition this is the this is a smooth manifold of dimension the Conley-Zender index of x minus the Conley-Zender index of y minus 1. So in the situation when, not minus 1, just like that. So when the situation when x and y uh, have adjacent indices, this is a one-dimensional manifold, so just the cylinders from x to y. And in fact, it has a finite number of trajectories from x and y. So I would say the partial, the Fleur differential of x is equal to the sum over all y. So the index here is m, the index of y is m minus 1. And here I want to take the number of trajectories from number of solutions. Let's call this a Fleur trajectory. The number of Fleur trajectories from x to y mod 2. Usually it's written as mxy divided by r, and then I need to take number, number mod 2, which amounts to the fact that this uh, equation is translation invariant. I can always shift the s time up and down, which gives me a free action of r. All right. So one important fact, one important fact, several important facts. is that the change of action from x to y is equal to the energy of the trajectory. This is, let's do it this way. So the action changes exactly by the amount of the L2 norm uh, of the L2 gradient of change integrated along the trajectory. This is a purely, uh, this is also true in Morse theory. This is just a purely formal consequence. But the important fact for us is that the action is strictly decreasing along the differential. That if y occurs in the image of dx, then the action on, on y is strictly smaller than the action on x. Again, this is um, just as in the ordinary Morse theory. And the second fact we need to know is that d squared is equal to zero. That this is really differential.
and the resulting homology yeah, the resulting homology is independent of H and rather naturally isomorphic to the homology of the manifold shifted by N with Z2 coefficients. Hence, there are no conjecture because the total dimension of this thing is the sum of Betty numbers by definition. And to get this large homology, you got to have just at, uh, at least the sum of Betty numbers of periodical. Now the filtered flare homology. This is something extremely important in all this business. Let's take the action spectrum of eight. These are the um, the collection of the critical points of uh, the critical values of the action function. Also, this is just actions on. on one periodic orbit. Without, so the fact, without any non-degeneracy condition. If age is non-degenerate, this is just a finite set. But regardless of that, the, um, so without non-degeneracy, this is a zero measure set. In particular, in this setting, it will be closed and over dense. Well, it's closed in, uh, yeah, in particular, in this setting, it will be closed and therefore over dense. So let's take two points, A and B, which are not in the action spectrum. I want to think of the interval A through B and do all the same thing, but only but only for the orbits with action in between A and B. So I require here in all these constructions, which I unluckily erased, uh, the X and Y to have action in the interval A through B. Then actually everything works. For instance, if in this differential I have Y with the action below A, I just ignore it then everything works literally and I get the homology which I denote HFI of H. And this of course depends on the interval and on H itself. For instance, adding a constant to H, well, it, it, it has no effect on the dynamics, but of course it shifts everything so the homology will change. Well, a more standard 
description uh, here is um, so this would be the homology of the complex comprising only the orbits with action in I. So one can think of it slightly differently. Let's take all orbits with action in the interval from negative infinity to B. This is a subcomplex. Let's take all orbits with action in the interval negative infinity to A. This is again a subcomplex. And take the quotient complex. That's exactly the uh, filtered square homology for the interval I. Now the Conley Zender index. So uh, on the blackboard I erased here. There was the It was mentioned. So the Conley Zender index. The linear algebra part. So here is a theorem. Barge and G's. There exists a unique quasimorphism delta from the universal covering of SP to N to R with the following conditions. First of all, it's homogeneous. Delta of uh, phi to the k is k times delta of phi. And it follows uh, from that that it's actually conjugation invariant. Two. Well, to have uniqueness, I need to normalize it somehow. Um, so I need to tell you what it is uh, equal to on at least one element. Otherwise, it could be 0. So I take the rotation in one of the coordinate planes, add to this the identity in the remaining part. So here t runs from 0 to 1. This is one full revolution. And I want this to be 2. And the third property is delta is continuous. And the remark is it's not actually smooth. Now, I have not told you what uh, a quasimorphism is. So now I have to. Uh, fill in that gap. Uh, so, quasimorphisms. Um, I want to have actually a homomorphism from this group to R. But this group is simple. So it has no uh, homomorphisms from uh, to R. So I'm going to go for the next, for the second best. And this group is very non-compact. So I want it to be a homomorphism up to a bounded error. 
In other words, delta of a product minus delta of its individual factors. This is the failure of delta to be a, a homomorphism. is bounded by a constant C, which is independent of these two guys. Now, uh, here, Polterovich always says that, um, no, that's not the right way to, that's not the right way to say it, because uh, this condition, it's not really a characterization in the sense that this condition is a consequence of the first two. So, in fact, it follows from the uh, remaining two. Um, but for us, it's important. And in fact, the quasimorphism part is not particularly important. It's rarely used in symplectic topology. I'm going to actually half prove this theorem. I'm going to construct it. The uniqueness is more or less a formal property. Here is an exercise. Um, let's say I have one delta. So an exercise. Let's say I have one delta. And let's take a map f from r to r, which I want to be linear as a linear map and totally discontinuous. So let's take f from x to, uh, from r to r such that f of x plus f of y is equal to f of x plus f of y. So it's a, it's a group homomorphism, but it is totally discontinuous. Such things exist, but let's replace delta by f composed with delta. It's still homogeneous. It still satisfies the normalization condition, uh, at least if I require the, the sort of, if I add a, con if, if I multiply the first suitable choice of it. Uh, but now it's discontinuous. So how come the sort of continuity follows from this too? So I'm, I'm t taking a continuous function and composing it with a discontinuous isomorphism R to itself. So something goes wrong. I'm going, maybe I'll try to remember what, uh, to tell you what's wrong here. But at the moment, I'm going to sort of half proof this uh, theorem. I'm going to construct this map. It's called mean index. And this is it. It already sort of appeared in Bashak's stock. Unfortunately, um, the group SP2N is very complicated. It's really a very uncomfortable matrix group to work with. Uh, so the construction will take me some time, but I think it's useful to see. The first step in the construction is what's called sometimes the raw map. I have SP2N. Inside SP2N, I have UN. And on UN, I have the complex determinant. This is a very nice map to the unit circle. And I want to extend this complex determinant to SP2N. Complex, the, the determinant is, of course, a homomorphism, and I want to extend it as a homomorphism, but I cannot for the same reason. Uh, I cannot for the same reason because SP2N is simple. Uh, 
So what I want from rho is I want it to be conjugation invariant and homogeneous. And the normalization is already accounted for by the fact that I'm extending uh, the determinant. Um, let's do it step by step. Because the group is so complicated, I'm going to start with SP2. Step one, maybe we can do it here. SP2 equal to SL2R. So let's take a matrix A. And, well, what are possibilities? Uh, what, uh, what can uh, A be? Well, A can be elliptic. It can have eigenvalues on the unit circle. In this case, it's conjugate to a rotation. And uh, so the fact that it's conjugation invariant and that I'm extending the determinant actually tells me what rho of A should be then. So A is elliptic. Uh, so that means it is rotation in theta. And then I have to say that rho of E is e to the i theta. But I have to be careful because sort of uh, e to the i theta, this is an eigenvalue of E. But E actually has two eigenvalues, e to the i theta and e to the negative i theta, and I need to pick up one of the two. If I just look at the eigenvalues, I don't know actually how to do it. But the point is that uh, is a rotation in theta is a, is a clockwise or counterclockwise. Or counterclockwise. So, if I, if I say theta is between 0 and pi, then in one case, I have to take so e to the negative i theta here or e to the positive i theta there. So I'm picking one of the two eigenvalues depending on whether I'm rotating uh, counterclockwise. Then I'm taking the eigenvalue in the upper half plane. So this is the case. And if I'm rotating clockwise, I'm picking up the eigenvalue in the lower half. Now, uh, so I'm, I'm picking one of the uh, two eigenvalues depending on which way that goes. Now, what else can happen? E is hyperbolic, and eigenvalues are positive. So the eigenvalues of E can be elliptic can be positive hyperbolic. Then I say rho of E is 1. And finally, E is, can be hyperbolic, but negative. So the eigenvalues can be here. And then I say rho of E is negative 1. There are some cases I 
have not, uh, have not considered. For instance, what happens when both eigenvalues are equal to one? Or when both eigenvalues are equal to negative one? But I claim that once I've done this, the row extends by continuity on um, to the entire group. So do this and then extend by continuity. For instance, let's say I have two positive eigenvalues on the uh, real axis. Let, let's make them uh, converge to uh, one. Well, I mean, I mean the, as they do so, the row remains constant and equal to one. So row here will be one. Let's say I have a rotation clockwise, a counterclock, uh, let's say counterclockwise, and I make the angle of rotation converge to zero. So this eigenvalue goes to, uh, to one, and row of A will go to one. Let's say I have a negative eigenvalue uh, converging to one. Then just by definition, rho remains constant and converges to negative one. Let's say I have a rotation which sort of goes all the way closer and closer to 180 degrees. Then this number will go to negative one regardless on which side I come from. So it, it's fairly easy to see it extends by continuity to a map with these properties. And now the second step let's take E in SP to N. And I wanted to have all eigenvalues distinct. And probably non degenerate too, in the sense no eigenvalue is, is equal to one. Then I can write E as the direct sum of some AJs in SP2 plus what can happen to, uh, what can happen in higher dimensions, I have something with complex hyperbolic eigenvalue. And then I just say rho of A is equal to the product of these two dimensional components with the complex hyperbolic uh, uh, part not contributing at all. And then again, it extends by continuity. Continuity. So this is the raw map. Uh, B does not contribute. So if you have uh, a linear transformation with only com with purely complex eigenvalues of the unit circle, then rho is one. So these guys just do not occur. Uh, these guys do not occur. Uh, um, there is actually an interesting exercise here because let, let's move the eigenvalues to the unit circle. 
So they stay off the, the, the unit circle up to the very last moment. Rho remains one all the way, but at the very last moment, I'm getting two pairs of elliptic eigenvalues. And it turns out that these two pairs actually are of different type. One of them, sort of that in the limit, I get a rotation in theta clockwise and plus the rotation in theta counterclockwise. So the resulting rows in the product will cancel and you have one. So this is actually a phenomenon that under lies the uh, extension by continuity. It's something extra you need to do in higher dimensions to prove that it, it extends continuously. All right, now, uh, delta is equal to the log of rho. Uh, literally what it, uh, so, 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 uh, how does it work? Let's say I have phi in the universal covering. Uh, so I'm thinking of it as a map from 0, 1 to sp to n. Um, no, uh, I, I probably want to do it differently. So this is a map from 0, 1 to sp to n. Here I, so that's phi. Here I have rho to S1. Here the exp r. This is the universal covering of S1. And I simply lift the composite map to r. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the function of the form e to the i lambda of t such that, so t is here, such that it's equal to rho of phi of t, and then delta of phi is equal to lambda of 1 minus lambda of 0 divided by phi. So that, that's the official definition. That's the way to think about it. Delta is the log of rho. So um, this is an integer. And geometrically, it means this. So uh, let's uh, think of phi of t as a pass. And let's start with uh, sp2. I'm looking at the eigenvalue. What happens to the eigenvalue along this path? The eigenvalue will change. So, and I'm picking each time the right eigenvalue according to this rule. So uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm rotating counterclockwise, reaching this point. At this point, the eigenvalue can split. So travel somewhere on the uh, uh, real axis. I don't care what it does, comes back. Maybe rotates back, then moves on, etc. So this the delta is the total angle sort of swept by the eigenvalue. And for sp2n, you do this to all eigenvalues, accounting for the possible bifurcations, and look at the total angle. So this is, roughly speaking, the total angle swept by the eigenvalue as in the process. It's easy to see from the definition that actually what you get is homotopy invariant, that it's really defined on the sp2. And as you uh, change this path up to homotopy, it remains the same. 
All right, the last bit of the definition I need to do, this is what's called, uh, what's called the mean index. Now, the Conlisander index. So uh, I'm going to do this. Uh, let's take SP2N and inside SP2N there is a space of non-degenerate ma uh, matrices, matrices such that one is not the eigenvalue of that. So I'm looking at those good guys where one is not an eigenvalue. So the complement the complement to this open set is what I would call the discriminant. It's a, a singular hypersurface in SP2N. And with some effort, one can show that this open set has two connected components. I'm going to pick a point in each of these connected components in each of the two connected components. In one connected component, I'm going to take a point W plus of the form negative two, negative one half, and then two one half, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a hyperbolic. transformation with exactly two negative eigenvalues. And in the second com uh, connected component, so I think this is actually W minus, I'm going to take the purely positive transformation, two one half, two one half, etc. So one of them will have all eigenvalues equal to one half and two. The other one will have all eigenvalues equal to uh, one half and two, except for a pair negative two, negative one half. So let's take a path ending outside the discriminant, a path ending in here. Then so something like this. This is one case and this is the other case. Then what I can do, I can take the endpoint of this path and connect it to one of these two marked points by something lying entirely outside the discriminant. So I'm sort of completing the path by connecting the endpoint to the mark point without intersecting the discriminant. So in terms of the eigenvalues, the picture would be like that. I'm sort of looking at one case. So this is what happens to the eigenvalue of the path. Then I am adding an extra part to the path. And what I'll do to, in this case, I'm going to sort of move the eigenvalue to negative one and then sort of off the, real, uh, off the unit circle. And actually, I'm going to do it like maybe it would be more convenient to 
make uh, more, I, I mean, I mean this, there are other choices of these matrices, but roughly you should think I'm doing it with every eigenvalue. So by definition then, mu of Conley, uh, the Conley Zender index of phi is equal to the mean index of this composite part. And this yellow stuff. And this is an integer. For instance, in this case, it's equal to one. So this, in this case, I think this way here is this. I'm tracking what's happening to the eigenvalue. It moves along the unit circle, stops somewhere, and then I'm completing the path by moving the eigenvalue to negative one and then off the axis. So in this case, I had some total rotation which is slightly over pi over two, and I made it into the tot uh, total rotation pi. So when I divide by pi, I get the Kornizender, of, uh, um, Kornizender index equal to, so in this case, the Kornizender index is equal to one. Two properties. Um, Here is another uh, possible way to think about the Kornizender index. Uh, and this is that this discriminant sigma is actually a co-oriented cycle. And what I'm doing here, I'm counting the number of intersections of the path or the intersection index of the path with the co-oriented cycle sigma. This definition is, uh, however, less convenient for us. And so two facts, which now more or less follow from the construction, is that the difference between the Conley-Zender index and the mean index does not exceed the dimension and in fact strictly smaller than the dimension. When at least one eigenvalue is different uh, from, uh, from one. This is called weak non-degeneracy. The second fact is that the mean index is really the mean index and that, in other words, that delta of phi is equal to the limit as k goes to infinity, the Conley-Zender index of phi to the k divided by k. This follows from the first fact and the fact that delta is homogeneous. So when I put k here, here I don't know what happens. Here when I m multiply phi by k, I can take the k out. N remains n. This is half of the dimension. And then I j just divide by, um, um, by k. The first fact easily follows from this picture. Here is a picture for SP2n. What's the difference between the Conley-Zender index and the mean index? The difference is smaller than pi, smaller than half circle. For each, and when I'm dividing by pi, it becomes less than one. And this is for each eigenvalue. But how many elliptic eigenvalues can I have in SP2n? How, how many pairs? I can have at most n pairs, hence n here. So that's actually an easy consequence of the definition. It's time for me to stop.
I am, um, there is a, uh, yeah, unfortunately, there is no, from here, it's more or less sort of a straight path to uh, the index of an orbit, unfortunate uh, of, a, of, a, of a closed uh, orbit of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. I'll do it next time. Unfortunately, there is not a very easy readable account of the uh, of the Conley Zender index. And unfortunately, sort of, I think most of us, once we learn it, we get this urge to like. It takes quite a bit of effort to learn it. So you think, okay, finally I've learned it. Now I'm going to sort of write uh, it in a very understandable way. And kind of what comes out is another, uh, yet like the, yet another totally unreadable account. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I don't think there is a very good and correct introduction to the whole thing. I, I personally learned it from um, Salomon Zender. There are other preferences, uh, but in any event, this is kind of a very short account of it. Let me stop here.